In November 1988, Sub Pop releases Nirvana's very first professionally recorded single hit, Love Buzz. And even though the UK indie underground scene embraces this new band with open arms and open ears, it would be seven long months before Nirvana's first full-length album would hit the market. In 1988-1989, Sub Pop co-founders Bruce Pavitt and Jonathan Poneman are well aware that the music journal within the UK indie underground scene will ultimately determine whether this new band Nirvana they're promoting will sink or swim. To their relief, following the release of Love Buzz, the UK underground scene does embrace Nirvana. Jonathan Robb of Sounds Magazine, a weekly pop rock music publication, names Love Buzz Song of the Week. In 1989, British music magazine Melody Maker's Everett True writes, Nirvana are beauty incarnate, a relentless two-chord garage beat which lays down some serious foundations for a sheer monster of a guitar to howl over. The volume control ain't been built yet, which can do justice to this three-piece. True also names Love Buzz joint US-UK single of the week and calls Love Buzz a love song for the psychotically disturbed. Aside from the long period of time in between the release of the Love Buzz single and the Bleach LP, Bruce and Jonathan also decide to only press 1,000 copies of Nirvana's first single. Because of the limited amount of copies of Nirvana's first single, Love Buzz would become a collector's item. Bruce and Jonathan would later describe this as a part of their master plan. The real reason they only pressed 1,000 copies was because they were broke. Matter of fact, Five months after recording Love Buzz, Kurt and Chris were calling up Jonathan and Bruce saying, hey, when are you going to press our single? Is this thing ever going to come out? Bruce ends up calling Kurt on the phone, asking Kurt if he can borrow $200 to help press the single. And in the book, Come As You Are, Kurt tells us he hung up on him, and very soon afterwards, Sub Pop found the money to press it, but again, only pressed $1,000. Imagine the frustration on Kurt Cobain, who wanted everybody to hear his music, but now no one can hear the music because it's not there for them to buy. Sub Pop had gambled on the band Green River and sunk a lot of money into their album Rehab Doll. Sub Pop sinks all their money into this album by Green River, putting all their eggs in one basket, and by the time the album is out, the band is defunct. Now eventually, the guys from Green River do go on to form other successful bands. Mud Honey, Mother Love Bone, Pearl jam. However, not before almost single-handedly bankrupting Sub Pop and leaving all the other bands on Sub Pop like Nirvana with an indie label that can barely afford them. And in the end, it would be Nirvana that saves them. Yeah, the, the first one was done more or less as a live thing. So this time around, was it, was it consciously like a studio effort and then away from the live sound? I don't think the first album was live. I mean, we recorded it in the studio. You know, yeah, we did overdubs. We, we did record it like basic way. tracks. No, we, we did. We, we overdubbed all guitar and um, yeah. vocals and yeah, everything. Oh, I thought it was done like, in like four days or I don't even forget how many days. Under a week, three, four, five days, something like that. Six hundred bucks. I, you know what? We were all, when we were mixing it, we were really sick, and Kurt went down to the health department, and he got. Uh, codeine cough syrups and we were just popping those and we were just like in la la land and then we were like hands-on producers just cooking on this codeine joy juice i think it had a big effect on how that record turned out that's the honest truth in the early days of Nirvana, Kurt, and especially Chris, loved trolling interviewers, loved giving them a hard time. So you might think that this is one of those situations where Chris is just being silly and trolling the interviewer, but not quite. The mixing process is where the album gets its character, its sound. So if you think that the mixes on Bleach sound a little strange, a little different than all the other Nirvana you've heard, there's a very good reason for that. We were all sick by then, Chris remembers, and 
and we had this codeine syrup from the Pierce County Health Department. So we were drinking a lot of that for our sickness, but we were really on codeine and we were mixing the record and getting really into it. Another part of the reason that the Bleach album sounds so much different than all other Nirvana, Kurt Cobain explains to Michael Azarad in 1993. Kurt Cobain they were just constantly having control right away, doing exactly what a major label would do and claiming to be such an independent label. Sub Pop has cultivated their own sound, what most call the Sub Pop sound, this primitive, esoteric, raunchy, grungy, almost doom metal style, and it allows no room for pop melody. By this time, Kurt Cobain's already writing songs with melody, but Sub Pop doesn't want melody on their records. What Kurt is referring to is the irony. He's on an independent label. He believed that he could creatively do whatever he wanted to do, and here's this independent label bossing him around, telling him what kind of guitar riffs he can use and what he can't use. That's why there are so many different remixes of the tracks on Bleach, and another part of the reason why it took so long to get it out. Bruce Pavitt had full control over the album. When you listen to Nirvana Bleach, you are getting Nirvana Nirvana Bruce Pavitt. You're not getting Nirvana Kurt Cobain. The irony is that when they make the jump to DGC, David Geffen lets them do whatever they want. And then that's when we see Kurt's pop melody side come out. He blends his punk rock and metal side, as he referred to cock rock bands like Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith. He blends that with butthole surfers and scratch acid and makes Nirvana never mind. Still, Bleach is an excellent album and I appreciate it for what it is even if Kurt wasn't able to do exactly what he wanted to, it still came across to me. And Nirvana Bleach does go on to sell 40,000 copies, pre-nevermind. 40,000 copies, let's think, back in the early 90s, an independently distributed cassette, such as Nirvana Bleach, would have went for probably around $7.99 to $9.99, times that by 40,000. And then ask yourself, should Kurt Cobain have been homeless when his next album came out? I understand that he shouldn't have been rich, but should he have been homeless? Where was all this money going? One more thing I'd like to throw into this section about the actual recording. Kurt goes to Jack and Dino and he says, you're probably gonna think I'm crazy, but I want you to include this track on this album. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is about a girl. The only song on the album that you're gonna find a Beatles-esque melody. I remember, and you remember too, the first time you heard Bleach, how much that song stood out from all the other songs on the album. It just seemed like, like it wasn't on the right album, but it gave us a little taste of what Kurt Cobain was capable of. And of course, Jack and Dino's response was, hey, it's your album. Screw Sub Pop. If you want it on the album, put it on the album. And they did. Ladies and gentlemen, there is still a ton of content and information to go over when it comes to Nirvana's Bleach era. I'm inviting you to a live chat tomorrow, June 16th, 2020. If you're watching this in the future, you'll still be able to see the live chat. And what I'm going to do is present more information live during the chat. Ask for your feedback. We're going to talk about the U.S. tour immediately following the Bleach release. And we're going to talk about the meanings of Kurt Cobain's songs. Now, he often said that there was no meaning. He wrote them last minute. But there are a couple songs that he did hint around to what he was talking about. And I would like to leave it open to interpretation to where we can have a discussion and people can share their thoughts about what they think certain lyrics are that I'll recite during the live chat. Tomorrow at this time, we're gonna be doing a Bleach live chat on the channel. I want you to come, bring your friends, bring your mom, bring your cousin, bring your Nirvana Bible if you got one. Nirvana, come as you are. I'll be referring to that book. We'll be reading some stuff out of that book. I'm basically going to finish this video for you live. No re-recording, no editing. It's going to be family friendly, I hope. As well, I will be releasing more information, more content on part two of my series, A History of Nirvana, which is going to cover the Bleach era. Over the next week, you're going to get a lot of Bleach era Nirvana out of me. So go ahead, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and join us for the Nirvana Bleach live chat tomorrow, June 16th, 2020. Turn on your notification to know exactly when that is, and if you can't make it, it will be there for you to watch at your convenience. See you guys tomorrow.